Good morning. Let's open with a word of prayer today. And as we do, ask the Lord to bless uh, in our services this morning. Continue to teach and help us to grow. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you for your goodness to us. And um, we praise you for teaching us of yourself each day. And so we ask that you would reveal yourself to us this morning. That you would grow in us a love and a desire for your word. And that you would ask that you would uh, work in us to humble ourselves in obedience and to worship you in our obedience of you. And uh, so we pray this morning that you would meet with us, that you would um, make it evident that you are uh, working in each of us and that you would bless in those ways. Uh, bless our church and our church people um, that we would um, glorify you, that we would uh, reach out to those around us that. Uh, we would be doing your will and your way and your work in this world uh, by giving the gospel to others, by encouraging one another and lifting up uh, your name, and may you be glorified. And so we ask that you do that even today as we sing, as we praise you, and as we open your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Find your place, if you would, in Matthew, the book of Matthew, in chapter number 16. We'll be there in just a moment. Matthew chapter 16. And it is a little hard to believe that we haven't been here for uh, three years, or at least in this capacity. And um, a lot has gone on and changed, and I, I enjoy and love uh, working with each of you and pastoring this church and these people, and I appreciate your patience with me as I learn and grow as well, and I'm um, thankful for each one of you, and it's been a blessing. The Lord's brought us through many things, and I'm excited about uh, what the Lord has uh, for our lives in store ahead. As you find your place in Matthew 16, um, I'll read to you a couple <clears throat> notes I've been given as well. Uh, it says, thanks to everyone for praying for my niece, Jennifer Clifton, her tumor. Remember, she had a brain tumor and uh, has been removed. She's doing well. <clears throat> she says, I'm thankful to God and thankful for a praying church. Jennifer and her family are also grateful. And that sign from Judy Miller. And then another, it says, Landmark Church family, thank you for your prayers, the cards, the calls and texts, and for your willingness to help in any way. <clears throat> As you know, my mom went to... Uh, uh, my mom went to sleep next to dad like she had for 62 and a half years and woke up in heaven on February 22nd. Said she's loved and deeply missed. Uh, she loved this church that she called home for over 35 years. And we are resting in the, God's promises knowing that we will see her again one day in heaven. And it's signed in love to all from uh, Jack um, Jr. as he signed here, and Debbie Knapp, Dr. Knapp and then uh, their family as well. And they're appreciative of uh, all that was extended and your condolences that you extended to them. Uh, Dr. Nass will be traveling a little bit over the next few weeks. You know that over the last couple of years, he hasn't been able to uh, get out and, and go to some of the churches. He has his Barnabas ministry that he likes to travel and encourage uh, pastors and churches in a number of different ways. He started doing that since he uh, retired. and. Uh, so he'll be out uh, some the next few weeks here and there, and uh, Jack and Debbie will be traveling with him some, which I think is a good thing, and uh, spending some time with him and uh, helping him uh, through this process. And uh, 62 and a half years is a long, long time. Uh, it's difficult to lose someone you love, but uh, especially when, when their life has been ingrained so deeply in yours. And so we want to keep them in our uh, prayers uh, in the next few weeks as well. All right, Matthew chapter 16 this morning. Uh, a, I think it's a familiar passage to most of us. There, I will say it this way. There are phrases in this passage that are familiar to most of us. Um, but I want to dig a little bit today. We're, not gonna, we're only going to be attacking seven verses or so this morning and uh, asking the Lord to teach us from them. Uh, these verses have been misunderstood by many, many people. In fact, there are complete, um, I, I guess you could call them denominations. There are uh, misinformed people, and there are people that have claimed these verses in false teaching, quite frankly. That is, 
given power to men that God did not. And so we want to pay uh, careful attention to what it is that Jesus is actually teaching and saying in Matthew 16. So if you will, look down in verse number 13. It says, When Jesus came to the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked the disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias or Elijah, others Jeremiah, Jeremiah <coughs> or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say also unto thee, Thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Father, as we study your word today, may you give us understanding and clarity, and we will praise you for it. May we with <clears throat> Peter declare this morning that you are the Christ, the Messiah, the only one who can save us, because you are the Son of the living God. There are no others but you. No one can save but Jesus. And we declare that this morning, that Jesus is Lord. And so with, our, with your work in our hearts, may we declare it with our lives, not just our mouths. And may we worship and live for you, that you are the Christ, the Son of God. And then may we sense the responsibility that you give to us as the church, that you have given to us the keys to... Uh, the gospel to share with all men, to be able to set free people from their sins, that you've given the church the authority to declare your gospel, and you've given us the responsibility as well. And so help us this morning. Teach us, work in us, and make this personal to us today. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> tell you, as a Christian, when someone preaches the Word of God <clears throat> in a correct and truthful and exciting manner, it should excite us. And when someone preaches with song, it should do the same. And uh, I'll read to you, some, some of you, maybe the first time you heard that song, I'll read to you the words. Like, yeah, sometimes I wish I could preach words as well as some people write them to sing. I should just steal this, read this for the sermon and be <clears throat> done today. But your word alone is solid ground, the mighty rock on which we build. In every line, the truth is found in every page with glory filled. So what do we find in his word? Through faith alone, we can come to you. We have no merit that we can claim. Sure that your promises are true. We place our hope in Jesus name. It's the gospel, is it not? In Christ alone we are justified. His righteousness is all our plea. God's law's demands are satisfied. His perfect work has set us free. By grace alone we have been saved. All that we are has come from you. Hearts that were once enslaved by sin enslaved, now by your power have been made anew. That's good truth, is it not? And uh, I hope it impacted your life this morning, pointed you to Christ. And hopefully the Word of God will do the same this morning. Matthew chapter 16 today. And you can find your notes there in the final page of your bulletin. And we'll walk through those. It actually extends to the back page here in a few minutes. And uh, we will look to this as we walk our way through this passage. As I mentioned, a familiar passage to us. and uh, But also one of those that can be a little confusing, if we're honest. Uh, a, f a few weeks ago, we studied a passage of Scripture in which Jesus speaks to a lady that comes to him. Or actually, a lady comes to him and he doesn't speak to her. <laughs> and um, 
he says, uh, she comes and saying, will you heal my daughter? She, he ignores her, and then he kind of makes it difficult, and he says, you know, I didn't come for the Gentiles. I came for Israel, and then she pleads again. She worships him, and he even goes further and says, like, should I take from children and feed to the dogs? And she responds in this testimony of faith, and she says, Lord, if you just give me even the crumbs, then I would be uh, satisfied with that, and he declares her great faith, and we said, that's kind of a confusing passage, and remember, some of what unlocked the passage for us was recognizing where Jesus was and who he was speaking to, and the things about Jesus that were always true, that he always knew people's hearts, and that he always knew what he was going to do. So he knew the woman's faith, and he knew that he was going to heal the daughter, and so what unlocked it for us was kind of where it is. Uh, and I think that that is the case this morning. As you look in uh, Matthew chapter 16, verse number 13, we're going to slow down and take a little bit of time here at the beginning to look where it says, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi. Uh, I had a teacher in college that kind of helped open my eyes to study the Bible in, in a little bit different way. He's a guy who had traveled all over the world. He had been to a lot of the places that are in Scripture, just an exciting person, and taught a number of different classes, but he taught my Bible geography class. And walking into Bible geography class the first day, I did not know what the world I was like, we're going to be studying maps, I'm going to have to memorize where stuff is, and, and just maybe a little bit of culture or something, I don't know what this is about. And to this day, that was one of my, probably one of my top two or three favorite classes I've ever taken in, in college, high school, it doesn't matter. It's one of the top two or three classes I've ever taken, just because it helped open my eyes to see that the, where the Bible takes place is a real place, and it has significance to it. And uh, he kind of had this principle. He didn't really say it this way explicitly, but it's a principle at least that I have kind of taken on in my own life. If I come to a passage in the Gospels particularly that tells me something that I'm, I don't get it maybe at first, I don't understand it, I, I'm trying to weigh what it might mean, if it includes the place, then often... I go back and study that a little bit, and it helps. And I think that that's going to be the case this morning. And so you see there that happened in Caesarea Philippi. But we're addressing this idea or this question. And we've paraphrased it there as the title of our message. Do you know who I am? And so this message is about identity. Not your own identity, but somebody else's. It's about the person of Jesus Christ. Do you know who Jesus Christ is? I think it's a, obviously an important question in life for us as Christians. It's an important question for anyone in this world who lives and dies and must answer the question well. Who is Jesus Christ? I'm thinking about an illustration that I, I heard about a, a crowded airline flight once that was canceled in uh, one of the United Airlines 767s had been withdrawn from service, and so it kind of threw everything off for people, and they had to pull people out of certain other flights, and flights ended up overbooked, and it was just sort of a, a mess, and there was a long line of customers waiting to figure out how they were going to get where they were supposed to get, and the one single attendant, the lady that was trying to work with them at the counter, and she's trying to be patient, trying to give good customer service, and most people were somewhat understanding, but a man walked up past the full line to the counter and asked to be helped immediately, and she said, sir, I'm, I, I understand your flight has been changed and can canceled, and we're going to have to figure this out, but if you'll stand in the line, then I'll, I'll get to you after I've, we work with these other people, and he said, do you know who I am? And she just smiled and politely said, uh, no, sir, but if, you, if I will help you as soon as I can get to you. So the man went back to the line and huffed and crossed his arms and couldn't believe that she had treated him in this way. And so the line went a little further and he came back up, said, I have to make a flight by such and such. And she said, sir, I'm almost to you. He said, do you know who I am? She said, no, sir, but I will help you as soon as I get to you. So he finally gets to the front of the line. She says, sir, there are, the flights are overbooked. I cannot I cannot get you on anything today or this morning. It's going to have to be later this evening. And he asked her one final time in a demanding voice, turning to where all the other customers came, do you know who I am? And the lady politely smiled, and she picked up the call phone, and she said, may I have your attention, please? There is a man at the counter 
who does not know who he is. <laughs> if anyone could come help us this morning, it would be a great service to this man because he has forgotten who he is. Finally, somebody woke up this morning. There we go. I don't normally do that at the beginning of a message, but now you're paying attention. So Jesus is asking that question, but he's not asking it in a demeaning way or in a spiteful way. He is asking his disciples, do you know who I am? And their answer is important. And so as we come to this conversation, it hinges around these two questions. He first asks, who do people say that I am? And then he says, who do you say that I am? And I think it's important to note, notice the question in verse number 15 and the way that it's phrased. He saith unto them, but whom do ye say that I am? Now, in our Bible translation, as it's, whenever you see the word ye there instead of you, ye is plural. So he's not asking only Peter. He's not asking one person. He's asking it in the plural form. If you look at the Greek word there, it's a plural uh, address. He is addressing all of his disciples. He's addressing them in a private moment, alone, away from everyone else. He's not asking them in front of the crowds. He's not asking them in a quote-unquote church service. He's not asking them in a moment when he is teaching, when he's working miracles. He has taken them actually away from all of those things. Luke says uh, in the same uh, story of the same account, uh, uh, the same event, Luke says that they had gone away. They were alone and even praying when Jesus asks this question. And so he takes his disciples to make it a personal question to them. And I think that if we examine the setting and the words of Jesus, you'll find he'll give us clarity about his heavenly kingdom this morning. So what I want to do is look, number one, look, look at first the place that Jesus asked the question, because I think that it's going to help us a little bit to the significance of why and why Jesus is asking this now and where Jesus is asking it. The only thing that's really told to us about the setting is in verse number 13. When Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, now that does not mean that he came to an actual coastline like an ocean coast. Coast could literally mean like the borders of, the edge of. Uh, it didn't necessarily speak of water. It was speaking of uh, the edge of a place. So as they come into the town of Caesarea Philippi, as they get to the edge of it, and he's bringing them there, and for a reason. You don't have to look back there for now, but in the map section, if you have one in your Bible, you see it's the northern section of Israel. It's north of the Sea of Galilee. It's actually at the very headwaters of the Jordan River is this town, Caesarea Philippi. So I want to talk to you for a moment about it. I'm going to put some pictures up on the screen. It's always fun when you can learn by pictures. And so we're going to do that this morning and uh, try to pay attention to what it is that the Lord is doing. We notice first that the Lord is taking them away from the crowds. Notice the last few chapters, Jesus has consistently been trying to move away from the crowds for a little while. He kind of leaves alone. It seems to go mourn the death of John the Baptist, but the crowd kind of finds him. And then he leaves and he goes up to Tyre and Sidon. He leaves the crowds and then he comes back down to the eastern shore of the Sea of Galilee, and the, there the, the crowds find him. And he works this big miracle, feeding of 4,000 Gentile, primarily Gentile families. And now he's uh, gone back over, and he's uh, working. Last week we talked about him working again and speaking to uh, the Pharisees, and he's uh, being confronted by them and going back and forth with them. And so you see how... Uh, Jesus has consistently been moving away from these crowds. And so he does that. Tells us that he's getting alone. He takes them away from a place that would have a primary, primarily Jewish focus. The city of Caesarea Philippi, or the region, was primarily a Gentile area. Meaning he's moved away from the group of people that are trying to make him the king. Remember, Jesus feeds the 5,000 people. And what do the Israelites want to do? Or what do the Jews want to do? They try to take him by force and make him the physical king of Israel. So he's moved away from that. He's moved away for a moment from the influence of their answer of who the Messiah should be or who they think he should be or making him king. So he's kind of removed those distractions for a moment. He's removed them, if you would, I'll say it this way, from the religious influence and base that these disciples had had for their entire lives. He kind of moves them away from that, takes it out from under them for a moment. He wants their answer. Who do you say that I am? Who am I? 
So Jesus takes them away to ask this question, but he takes them to this region of Caesarea Philippi. Now, Caesarea Philippi is about two miles from the city of what was called the city of Dan, which was the northernmost kind of city that Israel had kind of conquered and moved up and established. And it really didn't last extremely long. Eventually, the Israelites moved out of the city of Dan. They were kind of pushed out. The city of Dan itself kind of collapses and turns into ruins. And that's already happened by the time that Jesus is there. So, so here is Jesus taking his disciples to Caesarea Philippi, a Gentile area, within literally within eye shot of a place that was the northern border of God's promised land for the people of Israel. It's as far as they had north as they had settled. So they can kind of look and see the ruins that that kingdom, the kingdom, the former kingdom of Israel, it hadn't worked. It, it, it had collapsed. Their kings had led them in the wrong way. The people had rebelled against God. In fact, the city of Dan, uh, had eventually they had established um, altars and small temples to idols. To, they had taken on the idols of the Canaanites. It had become a place of idolatry even. So it's kind of a, a sign or a symbol of how God's people had turned away from God and how when God's people tried to rule themselves and establish this physical kingdom, it had fallen apart. Now, just a couple miles away, again, within eye shot, there is this new, kind of brand new, in fact, the city itself was built when Jesus was probably about a, a teenager. So it's almost a brand new city itself. And he takes him to this brand new city of the world's kingdom is established by Rome or by Roman influence with Greek gods. We'll get to all that in a moment. But so he takes him and he sees how God's first kingdom of Israel had fallen and failed. Now there's this world's kingdom that has been built up in this city that he's taking them to. To give you a little bit of a setting, it sits at the foothills of Mount Hebron, which is a massive, massive mountain on the northern part of Israel. You can kind of see it in the background there that there is, it's kind of snow-capped. It stays snow-capped most of the year. In fact, uh, there's this a nice ski resort that's on the top of Mount Hebron. The, the borders of Lebanon, Israel, and Syria all kind of converge here. So there's portions of the mountain that belong to each of these countries. It's, it's a very tall mountain. It's 9,600, I believe, feet tall, which means it's about 3,000 feet taller than anything east of the Mississippi. If you've been up to New Hampshire and seen Mount Washington or you've been to Clingman's Dome, it's kind of a similar feel down in North Carolina, Tennessee. There's a few mountains, but still, this is extremely tall mountain for this region of the world. It stays snow-capped. In fact, the snow melts, and as it melts, it comes down into the valleys. It runs through Caesarea Philippi and begins the Jordan River. So the Jordan River starts here with the waters of Hebron. Well, this kind of shows you how those waters kind of make their way. It's a very rocky area, mountainous area, which Jesus in a moment is going to speak about rocks and stones and uh, it converges. It's a beautiful location. It's a beautiful place. Well, in Caesarea Philippi, the reason that there's a city there is there is this um, a grotto. There's a spring in the side of this mountain. It's called, eventually it was called the Grotto of Pan, who was the Greek god of desolate places. And so uh, they, there's this beautiful place there. Herod, about 40 years before Jesus is born, Herod the Great uh, builds a temple there. It's the only thing that's there. He builds a white marble temple to the god Pan, and he builds it just outside the spring. It kind of becomes a religious place. No town, no city there. Not long after Herod the Great passes, his son, Philip the Tetrarch, who is uh, now leading and now becomes king of kind of a similar region, that northern region, he comes in and he builds in this area a city. But you see there, it's a large cliff. This kind of shows the grotto from the background. You can see it's a large rock. It's a big rock that comes down out of Mount Hebron through the valleys. There's a spring coming literally out of these rocks, out of the mountains. You see there the pillar in the foreground. That's part of the ruins of one of the temples that was built there. And in Jesus' day, it would have looked similar to this. I know you may not be able to see that extremely well. The grotto is there. Cave is kind of there on uh, your left. And then you see the temple that was one of the temples that was built and then another temple that was built. Uh, they had established a government courts there. There was a palace that was built for Philip. And then eventually the city expanded. And you can kind of see things are etched, literally etched into the rock. The uh, city itself is built into the side of this large 
uh, cliff-like side of the mountain. And then you have the city eventually is established and built out from there, really just a few years before Jesus comes with his disciples. So what do we have? You say, what in the world are we talking about all of this for? We're going to get there, all right? So you have Jesus brings his disciples to a mountainous area and the city, to a city that's built into the side of a mountain rock that has a spring coming out of it, where they build temples to false gods, where there is a palace for Philip the Tetrarch, or, uh, who is ruling and leading at that point, who has his authority from Rome itself. And Rome gives the authority to it. They put the, kind of the, the regional government is established there. So Jesus takes his disciples to a city that is brand new and shiny. Like compared to Jerusalem that's been destroyed twice by this point, temples that have been rebuilt, walls that have had to be re rebuilt. It's over a thousand years old, different portions of it. Jesus takes his disciples to a shiny brand new city where things are starting to begin to thrive and there's temples to false gods and visually it's a stunning place and Jesus brings his disciples there oh and this is neat interesting by the way Philip decides he's going to name the city after himself he names it for the first emperor of Rome who would be Caesar Augustus the son of Julius Caesar he names it for him but there's already a town called Caesarea so he says well we've got to distinguish I'll give it another name for myself so it's named after the earthly ruler and the emperor at the time, who, by the way, is called, one of his titles that he propagates for himself, he calls himself the Son of God. After Julius Caesar was killed, uh, he is deified, and he's made into one of the gods of Rome. And so he takes his disciples to a place, elaborate buildings, beautiful place, built up to the world system of government, the world system of worship, named after a man who called himself the son of a god. And he asks his disciples there, who do you think that I am? And notice, we don't want to skip the first question. He asks this question saying, who do men say that I, the son of man, am? He's drawing attention to what others say about him. Others who were... Uh, focused on the same things that you might see in Caesarea Philippi. Though the Jewish people didn't want to necessarily serve the Roman government, they wanted their own government. They wanted to take over and be the same thing. They wanted the elaborate buildings. They wanted the massive armies. They wanted protection. They wanted resources. They wanted riches. They wanted to thrive, and they wanted to build again. And so when Jesus came... Initially, that's what people wanted from him. Become the great king of Israel. Give us our liberty and our freedom back. Establish with us and in us this great, magnificent kingdom. And Jesus didn't do that. And you notice from their answer, they said, who, do, who are people? Who are the crowds saying that I am? Notice their answer. Some say that are John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah. Now, it's interesting. We won't go into each reference for time's sake, but John the Baptist was viewed as this forerunner, and he had already been killed at this point. So some people say, well, maybe his spirit has come back, and it's living in this one that calls himself Jesus. Then you have Elijah, who was prophesied not by Scripture, but by the Jewish people that Elijah would one day come back from the dead. Or, or actually, you know, he'd been swept away by the Lord, but that he would come back to earth and that he would be the precursor for the Messiah. So then they also say Jeremiah, who was also viewed as he's going to come back from the dead, kind of Jewish legend, and he's going to be the precursor for the Messiah. So notice in their answer what they say. It seems that people have seen Jesus long enough to realize he's not going to be the Messiah that they want. He's not going to be the great king that gives them everything. He's not going to be the one that establishes the kingdom of Israel again and conquers Rome. So who they think he is, he's a great man, he's a good man, he's leading us well, he preaches well, he does these miracles. He must be the one coming right before the Messiah. So in other words, his, the answer to this, Jesus says, who are people saying that I am? And the disciples' response is, well, people are saying that you're the one that's going to come right before the Messiah. Why? because he wasn't the type of Messiah that they wanted. And then Jesus says to them, well, who do you say that I am? 
And then notice their answer as we walk through. He asked this second question to be more personal. The question posed to the disciples, and this is the unity of the church as you find this in his answer. Notice that the answer that Peter voices, it's short, but it embraces all that is in our salvation. He says, you are the Christ, meaning the Messiah, the anointed one. You are the son of the living God. And I want you to notice what Peter does. And we give Peter a hard time, I think, sometimes about who he was and how he spoke. And in a second, he's going to make a mistake. He's actually going to correct Jesus about something in just a few verses. But in this moment, Peter makes this declaration. Now, he did not understand exactly what that meant. And he makes it obvious because in a moment he argues with Jesus, says, no, 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 you're not going to die. He didn't understand how Jesus was going to set up his kingdom, but he knew that Jesus would. So again, we're going to keep going back and then we're going to bring this kind of to a head and apply it in just a moment. We're going to kind of, kind of picture Jesus takes his disciples to a grand place, visually stunning, huge rock cliffs all over the place at the foot of Mount Hermon, this massive mountain that is near them. So he establishes that visually with them. Then he shows them, or then they can see this temple built to the false god, the Roman government, the Israelites or the Jewish people that have kind of submitted to that. They have succeeded and they're thriving. And he brings his disciples into that and he asks them, who are people saying I am? And they say, well, you're, you're going to usher in the Messiah is what they think. Who do you think that I am? And they have to, in the midst of the system of the world, say, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. Now the word Christ or Christos in uh, the Greek, it's the same word that they would have used in the Hebrew form that would have been Messiah. So Christ and Messiah literally mean the same thing. He, you are the anointed one. We won't, for time's sake this morning, but we could do a whole study on what that means and all the things that the Old Testament pointed to in the Messiah. You have Psalm, all through the Psalms, of chapter 2, verses 6 through 8, talk about the king that was coming, the coming king. Isaiah chapter uh, 9 talks about the king that would come and reign forevermore. Isaiah 61 talks about him being the chosen king. Daniel chapter 7 talks about him being the one that was to come. And so you have this king that is supposed to be coming, this glorious king that is supposed to be coming, and the Old Testament talks about it over and over, and how, is it, how does the Old Testament describe it? It describes him as a universal king, a king over all things and all people, a cosmic king, a, a glorious king, a humble king, a great king, a forever king with absolute dominion and power, and so when Peter says to him, you are the Christ, he's saying, you are the king. You are the one that God has promised. You are the one in Genesis 3 that says you're going to crush the head of the serpent. We don't know how it's going to happen, but you are the Messiah. You're the Christ. And think about how significant that was in Jesus, uh, standing in Jesus' presence in the midst of the world's system saying, P Peter saying, none of this has the power. The, the great mountain, the temples, all the things that are built up for the wrong reasons, the false gods, the palaces, the authority, the Roman government that now rules the world. But you are the real king. You are the anointed one. And I want you to think for a moment that we even as the church today proclaim the same as Jesus, uh, same message in to Jesus or for his glory. So here's Peter in the midst of the world system saying, Jesus is still the real Messiah. And God calls us as Christians to stand in the midst of the world's system, in the midst of a place of grandeur sometimes and splendor, of amazing feats, of accomplishments of humanity, in a place of authority and in a place that displays power, in a place that people vie back and forth for opinion or people go back and forth to establish who has greatness and who has power and who, who try to do great things, who worship even false things. In the way of the world's way and their system and their worship, we are still to declare Jesus is the Christ. He is the Messiah. Now imagine, here's Jesus with 12 men. They have nothing. 
They have no armies. They have no riches. They have nothing to show you to display this great kingdom of heaven that he's talking about. He's standing in the midst of a new bright and shiny city, and yet they're defying it, saying, these things are not what will hold forever. Jesus alone will rule and reign for all of eternity. And why is that, does Peter say in the next phrase? Because you're not just the Christ, you're the son of the living God. And you can kind of imagine Peter's defiant spirit saying that. Where is Peter standing? He's standing in Caesarea Philippi, named after Caesar Augustus, who called himself and propagated himself as a son of God. And here he is standing in a city named for a man that called himself the Son of God, standing at a city that is built up around two temples for false gods, and he looks to Jesus and says, You are the Christ. You're the Son of the living God. You're the Son of the real God. You're the Son of the true God. Regardless of what the world around me says, you are the Messiah. You're the son of the living God. You are the one that God has sent to us. And we are called in the same way to stand in the midst of a world that is drastically confused, that is vying for authority, that is fragmented. How many different kingdoms and countries are there in the world and in and wars that are going on at all sorts of points and fighting, whether it be with actual weapons or trade wars or authority or legislation. And they're going just back and forth, vying for some sort of authority that ultimately will not last. Even the Roman Empire, that this great Roman Empire that's now been established around the world in Jesus' time, only lasts a few hundred years. And so as he says this to his disciples and they return, or Peter returns the answer, we can kind of echo the same thing. That regardless of who it seems has the authority, and regardless of what it seems matters in this world, who has the riches, who builds the shiny new things, and who has established all that their heart desires, we still declare that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And when he establishes his kingdom, not only will it reign over all of these other kingdoms, there will be no other kingdom. There will be no one that stands in his wake. There will be no one that stands up against him. He will conquer all, and he will reign and rule forever. There will be no challenge to his power or his authority. And as crazy as it may have seen for 12 men plus Jesus to stand there in the midst of this shiny new city and say, well, Jesus is the real king, anyone that was around them would have thought what? <laughs> they are foolish. Who are you? You're visitors. We've never seen, like if someone from Caesarea Philippi came out, or say Philip the Tetrarch himself comes out, the king or the rulers, they come out, who are you? Well, we are uh, followers. This is our rabbi. He is the chosen one, the son of the living God, king of all that is. Who are you? <laughs> Where did you? We've never seen you in our whole lives. We've never seen you. You are fools for thinking that we could kill you right now. We could take you captive. We could take you prisoner. Look at all that we have built. How does it feel sometimes in this world system? to declare that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. It feels foolish. And I don't mean that we should feel foolish, but I mean in the way that we are viewed. Because people stand and they look around, look at all this around us. Look at all that we're doing. Look at all that we've established. Look at the progress of science and humanity and infrastructure and engineering. With all the concrete, we're going to space. We could do all these things. Is there even really a God to begin with? Do we need God? If there is a God, do we even need him? And people believe there is no God even at all. You're foolish for believing that a man that lived 2,000 years ago was actually God himself, the son of God. How foolish are you? Because where is he now? We don't see him. You're all by yourself, this little group of people that say that Jesus is the Son of God, yet look at the world, look at what we have around us. You're foolish for believing that. The disciples would have been viewed the same way. But notice what Jesus says to Peter after he tells him that. The answer reveals the work of God in Peter's heart. 
Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. He says, you didn't figure this out on your own. <laughs> Peter, your, your actual body and brain didn't figure out some sort of formula that told you that I'm the Messiah. Who did? Notice, but my Father, which is in heaven. And, and so you have this declaration. Jesus says, look, Peter, you, you've gotten it. You've started to understand. And you didn't get that on your own. You should praise the Father for this. Because it's only by His working in your heart that you ever came to understand that. Have you ever wondered why you understand and believe Scripture? That you've given your heart, your life, your mind to Jesus Christ by faith, trusting His grace and His mercy, and yet other people hear the same message and don't get it? It's not because your brain is better, but it's because God spoke to your heart. And in humility and in, by your responsibility, yes, you submitted to that. But it is God working in you. So we should be grateful, not just that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God, but that He's revealed it to us and He's helped us understand it. Uh, we should walk out of here. Some of the song that Philip sang earlier, some of the songs that we've sung in today and even the last few services declaring the glory of God, we should walk out as Christians enamored and consumed, constrained by Christ in the fact that we look up and realize the God of heaven has revealed himself to us and he's done it through his son, Jesus Christ. It should shake us to the core. This is not like a club that we've joined and we go bird watching and we feel special because we're in a group of other people that also like to look at birds. Like Christianity is not that. It's not a club you've joined. It is a life that has been changed by God's power for his glory through his son, Jesus Christ. And here he says, you are the Christ, the Messiah, the son of the living God. But I want you to notice as we close, notice this last point. Notice the promises that Jesus attaches to it. He says, okay, now that you've got it, you're standing in the midst of the world system, yet you can still say, this is not the true kingdom. This is not where real authority is. It actually belongs to Jesus. It actually belongs to God. And now Jesus says to him, with that belief and information, there is responsibility and opportunity for you. Notice what he does. He makes a play on words, in my opinion, with Peter's name. Peter's name in the Greek would have been Petros, which is very similar to the word Petra. Petros means a stone, usually like it would refer to like a small stone, something you could handle with your hands or throw into a lake. And so he says, I've called you Petros. Remember who gave Peter that name? Jesus himself anyway. He says, I'm going to call you a stone. And so he says, I have said unto you that you are called Petros. You are Peter. You're a stone. And notice this phrase. And upon this rock, he uses there the word Petra. You think of the city of Petra. It's a massive city literally carved into stone. And so you can kind of get the picture. It's a large bedrock, a huge stone, kind of like the one built in the backdrop of Caesarea Philippi that we just looked at a picture of a moment ago. Maybe he's even visualizing. He says, Peter, you're a stone, and on this rock I'm going to build my church. Well, what rock is he talking about? Contrary to Catholic belief or even some others, he is not saying here that Peter is the foundation of the church. He's not saying that Peter as a human being is going to be the first pope and that he gives him power in a moment to loose or bind or forgive sins. That's not what Jesus is teaching or saying. That's not what he's giving Peter. He's saying you are a stone and you're going to be part of a greater church that God is going to build with other stones. And he says upon this rock, you say, well, what does he mean by this rock? I think there's two reasonable thoughts for this. Jesus could be talking about himself. He could literally be saying, Peter, you're a stone on this rock. I'm going to build my church on Jesus himself. He could be. But I, I think that within the context of the statement, he is speaking not just about himself as an individual, as the Savior, but about the principle that Peter has just said. You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter, you're a stone. But on your statement that you just said, I am going to build the church. It's going to be a group of people that, be, that also believe that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. Turn to 1 Peter just for a moment, if you would. 1 Peter chapter 
to let's let Peter explain it to us as he writes a little later. 1 Peter chapter 2, if we're confused as to what he means by this. 1 Peter chapter 2. And look at verse 4. To whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, you also as what? Lively stones, living, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore, it is also, it is contained in Scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you, therefore, which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed. G Peter gives us a great picture. He says, we are stones, lively stones, built together on Jesus Christ. And we're placed there by our belief that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, the coming reigning King, the living God that will never be challenged in His authority, that will have an eternal kingdom forevermore. So Peter helps us understand what he's speaking of. He says, you're a stone. I'm going to use you as part of it. And he, Jesus would say to us today, you're a stone. You're a stone. You're a part of the church. You have been laid on this foundation that is Jesus Christ. And you have a responsibility. Notice back in Matthew 16, and we'll finish. Notice it says in verse, as Jesus continues to teach. You're Peter, verse 18, upon this rock I'll build my church. Notice this phrase, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be loose that shall be bound in heaven whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven then he charged his disciples that they should tell no man that he was jesus the christ this is where it can kind of get tricky for us because the catholic church again would use this and other verses similar to this and a similar account in john to say well this means that people like peter was the first pope the disciples were like priests and this means that Whoever they loose from their sins on earth is loosed. Whoever they don't forgive is not forgiven. They have the power to forgive sins and not forgive sins. It's not what it's teaching. Notice it says, I will give to thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Now, what else would that tie to? What in the passage that we just read would a key go with? Look back in verse 18. What would you use a key on? You don't put a key in a rock. What is it? A gate. So tie the two statements together. We kind of picture it this way, and this is, this is going to get exciting. Okay, get excited. Rev your engines. Gentlemen, start them. Ladies, start them. Whatever. This is where it gets exciting. Here's what we sometimes picture. Here's Jesus. He has told his disciples, you, the disciples say, you are the Christ, the Son of God. And he says, yes, I'm going to build my church on that. The gates of hell won't prevail against you. What we picture is like the church building, and we as people, inside the church and like Satan's on the door like shooting his fiery little darts and like he's throwing fire and bombs at the church and they just and when it's all said and done the church will still be there we're not gonna we're not gonna be destroyed by Satan but tie these two things together he says the gates of hell literally the gates of Hades which is interesting there's some other things there the spring that was there in the grotto was sometimes called that like the earth so he's visualizing it nerding out on you anyway so you have the gates of hell and the keys of heaven. And what is Jesus saying? The church is going to be established on this truth. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And those that believe in this, the gates of hell won't prevail because this is the key of the gospel for them to be saved. He says, here are the gates of hell. It is not that Satan is attacking the church and just the church will we'll be able to stand and we won't collapse and God will help us and protect us from Satan. That's a truth. That's not what's taught here. He says, with this truth, that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, you can attack the very gates of hell where people are trapped in their sins, where people are lost without hope, where they are bound for eternity to be judged by God for their sins with no hope of mercy and grace. Peter, disciples, church, here are the keys of heaven. The gate of hell 
cannot stand against this key. The souls that are locked in sin, the people that you don't think can be saved, the family member that is away and cold to the Lord, the children that you wonder about their salvation, the neighbor that never seems to want to talk about God, the people that we're trying to reach out to in our community, the people that you knock on their door, children that we try to bring to church, people that you invite, people that you sit with in your work for 10 years at a time and try to influence for the Lord. Here is the promise. Are, is everyone in the whole world going to be saved? No, it's not saying that. But it is saying that the gospel is more powerful to unlock their heart from the sin and judgment of it than the gates of hell that hold them there. And he says, here is the truth, Peter. What you have just said can unlock a man's soul for eternity. And when someone is bound here on earth and they have not been unlocked, they're bound in heaven. But when you take this key and you unlock that gate, when it is loosed, it is set free forever. Amen. And so as we close this morning, are you glad that the key of heaven has unlocked the gate of hell that covered your heart? Like we should be. That we have been set free and we never have to go back there again. Are you discouraged that more people aren't saved? Are you discouraged that you just don't seem to have what it takes to win someone to Christ or that someone's not coming and the world is you know, literally on its way to hell and it seems like in a faster way than ever before? Are we discouraged and downtrodden by that? We may feel that at times, but here's Jesus' thought to us. If you say that I am the Son of the living God, the Messiah, the Christ that will reign and rule forever, the gates of hell that hold people's hearts cannot prevail against you. How bad is it, though, if Jesus has given us this key and we have put it in our pocket? We've put it away because we don't think that it works. Because we don't think that it's effective. Because we think that someone's gate is too strong for God's key. It's interesting, Jesus tells them this. And then in verse 21, he says, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and scribes and be killed. So, so Jesus ties it. What does he do? He ties the good news of the gospel to the bad news of the day. <laughs> he says, I'm going to die and I'm going to leave you. How, how much worse could it get? The Messiah is going to die. He's going to not be with them anymore. Yet he ties to it the hope. I'm the son of the living God. I'm the Messiah. And even death will not keep my kingdom from being established. And so whatever you're going through in life right now, if you've had a moment, death has influenced your life, hardness Difficulty, sin, temptation is overburdening, overbearing guilt, shame. You're away from the Lord. You're cold spiritually to Him. The promise is the same. That Jesus is the Christ, the forgiving Son of the living God. And He promises to work in your life. And regardless of how difficult a circumstance may be, we have the hope that His key is greater than Satan's gate. So let's ask the Lord to help us to win others for Him, to follow Him into these moments. Lord, we praise You for Your goodness. We thank You for Your good truth, for Your Word. We stand in the midst of a world that uh, has many shiny things. Sin is enjoyable for a moment. And sometimes it's hard to think about eternity when we're in this moment of life. The world's governments, the world's power, the world's authority, the world's worship. Their shiny things seem so good, so powerful, so captivating. That even sometimes we as Christians fall and fail, are held captive by it. And we wonder sometimes how, if we struggle with it, how would anyone that's not a Christian ever be set free? 
And Lord, we're thankful that you've given us the mission to declare in the midst, right in the midst of a world of shiny, false hope that you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. May you help us, like Peter, to stand in an uncomfortable place, not surrounded always by friends and by people that will agree, to stand in the midst of a world darkened by sin and declare you are Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And then to help us to understand the responsibility that we have. That you have handed us the gospel, the key, the power to the knowledge of God, relationship with you. You've given us that key. And you have assigned us to go. We are to unlock the gates of hell as often as you will let us. So we pray that you would work in our hearts first. Burden us to tell, burden us to go, burden us to pray. And that you will unlock the hearts of those that are lost. Our friends, our family, our neighbors, strangers that are living in the midst of a world of shiny things. May you forgive us and may you help us to declare that forgiveness to them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand if you would. The Lord's worked in your heart about someone, a person, a place where the gates of hell seem strong. I encourage you here at this altar there at your seat to pray and ask God by His Spirit through the Father to unlock, to allow you to help be the key to convince us once again to declare to the world around us that He is the Christ, the Son of God. And we pray this.